What's up everyone? Lance Hedrick here, and today we're taking a look at the Breville Barista Touch Impress. It's important to note that there was a previous Barista Touch that came out some years back, and this is kind of the next iteration of it with the Impress technology and some other technology that's been included into the software. Now, this is a similar upgrade to what the Barista Express recently underwent with the Barista Express Impress. I've got a video linked right there that goes over that. Now, on this machine, they're still using that Faro technology, which gives you rapidly heated water in around, in around three seconds. So you literally walk up to the machine, click go, and it's heated up. That's because it's not using a standard boiler where a massive amount of water needs to all be heated up to brewing temperature. It has kind of a coil-like system inside where it spreads the water out into really thin uh, pathways and so that when all those pathways heat up, it's like instantaneous heating. What's different between the original touch and this one? What makes this better? What justifies the price point? Who is this for? Is it worth it? So of course this still houses a 54 millimeter portafilter and it comes with the standard dual wall and single wall filters for both single and double shots. And the single shot baskets you're getting anywhere from like seven to 11 grams and the double shot basket you're getting anywhere from 15 to 19 grams. This has just a very simple touch screen. So we also have this lever on the side which as I covered in the express video and there is a tamper Boop, that goes down and does a seven degree kind of polish twist. I actually recommend baristas don't do that little twist, the barista twist, because whenever you're twisting, you actually have a high chance of tilting the tamp one way or another. Any movement that tamper is making is going to make that puck unlevel. And this, obviously, that's not a big deal. It is level. It's providing 10 kilograms of force consistently. Based off of the tension it's getting when it pushes down, it can know if you're underfilled or overfilled in the basket. Now, usually people think in terms of grams when they look at baskets. They see a basket and they think, okay, this is a 16 gram basket. And then because it's rated 16 grams, they'll put 16 grams in it. But that's throwing out a ton of variables that can affect the ideal dosage for a specific basket. Now, of course, you can under and overfill baskets. It's not a bad thing, but there is an ideal volume for a basket, and that can vary in weight. So some basket companies will actually rate their baskets 15 to 18 grams or something along those lines to account for the variation of density in coffee beans. Now, what I mean by that is if we had the same volume in two different pucks, but this puck has dark roast and this puck has light roast, well, this one is going to weigh more even though the volume is the exact same. The reason for that is it's more brittle and more can fit in, essentially. It's, it's got, it, it'll be a more densely packed puck than the lightly roasted one will be. But volume is what really matters in these baskets because we're talking about headspace, this dead space above the puck into the machine itself. One of the big target audience of this are people who don't want to faff around with the scale. You don't need a scale, actually, to pull great and replicable espresso. You just need to make sure your volume is perfect in the basket and then your grind size is perfect. I love the volumetric feature. I don't care what the dose in is. I mean, I want to know after, but I don't care about the coffee being dosed in. I want the volumetrics perfect for that because also that's going to optimize body for my espresso, which a lot of times I'm looking for. So with this machine, it's going to give me the perfect dose for these baskets, regardless of coffee. What this is doing is every time you tamp, it's going to measure if it's too little coffee in there, it's not feeling enough tension or it's too much. It's not able to give the full, the full structure all the way down. If there's too much coffee, you may not be able to go all the way down. So it'll tell you if you need more or less coffee. If you need more coffee, the screen will prompt you to grind more. You just click grind more and it'll grind a little bit. You tamp again and it'll say, okay, you still need more coffee or you're at the right amount of coffee. You tamp and tamp and tamp until you have the right amount. And then once it says, okay, you're good, the amount that it ground is saved inside the brain of the machine. So that next time you go, it's already dialed in for that. Now, of course, the obvious issue here is that shot where you ground, tamped, ground, tamped, ground, tamped, that's gonna be an awful shot. You'll see the whole edge around it is fully untamped, but the middle is tamped. Will it be adequate? Absolutely. For the darker roasted coffee you have, it's gonna matter less and less. Those coffees are very easily extractable, very soluble, and just to tamp, you're not gonna get as much issue because the puck resistance is so much higher than you would with a lightly roasted coffee. So if you're drinking lighter roasted coffees, here is a hack that I have figured out that I think is very helpful. You can get one of these funnels from Breville or Sage. This is made by them to fit on their 54 millimeter portafilters. You put it on, click it on, boom. After you have your dose fully figured out, the machine has learned how much you need, so you don't need to use a scale. Because this emulates a portafilter, you pull this out, lock it on, it detects that there is something inside the forks itself in order for it to be able to grind. I can go ahead and grind it. 
just like you would normally. This is all you need to do. We have it. We have our WDT or just like acupuncture needles or something, paper clips, whatever you have. And we're just gonna, you know, go around. Then once we're done, I'm just gonna give it some taps to kind of settle it. There we have our puck. Now we can put it back into the system and tamp. Now they recommend and I recommend tamping twice. So this is actually the perfect amount. We have our green level. As you see, there are three notches below and three above telling us if we're below a certain amount or above a certain amount. And then I'm just going to wipe off any grounds that we have. So now we're ready to put the shot in and give it a pull. We had it WDT'd, so we've completely distributed the puck, but now we have pre-infusion going. It heated up the water with those first couple of seconds. We have pre-infusion and the full pump is kicking on. And there we have our espresso coming out. You have the Olka pump in the back. So it's just a typical vibratory pump. And we have our stainless steel portafilter and we have the pre-infusion using the, using the potentiometer technology inside the machine itself. There we have our shot of espresso. This is a lightly roasted washed Colombian pink Bourbon. What this does have an advantage over the Barista Express, however, is the grinder in this is much better. Breville acquired Barazza a few years ago. Touch Impress has the Barazza Encore ESP burrs inside of it. M2 cone that Barazza uses, which is really exciting. So this will still absolutely do great with darker roasted coffees. Those are actually much easier to do, needs a lot less maintenance. But these will also fare very well with medium and lightly roasted coffees, which the original pentagonal burr in the normal Barista Express and their Smart Grinder Pro simply has struggles with. It's not introducing the beans as quickly into the burr set, which has caused strip gears in the past if you put super lightly roasted coffee into that big pentagonal burr. So this one, you have 30 options on espresso grinding, which is gonna give you a big range from the lightest of roasts to the darkest of roasts. And on top of that, you have an extra amount of adjustment inside the cone burr itself. So if you look at the collar of the cone burr, you can switch to 10 different sets settings which will open or close up the amount it can do. For that alone, if you are someone looking for a grinder espresso machine combo, this is going to do you very, very well. Let's go ahead, stir up this espresso and give it a sip. That was quite good. It was a little sour. I needed to pull more, but I did, wasn't weighing the output, so I was kind of going based off look. For this, I was on setting 13 of 30, and this was pretty light, which means there's still 13 or 12 steps below that. Is it like really intense granularity, like something that's stepless or like something that has five micron steps? No, but is it more than good enough to get a great shot of espresso with any roast profile? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Now, if you're done tamping and it shows that it's got too much coffee, what you do is simple. You take their little razor, which is a really nice little tool that a lot of people misunderstand. A lot of people think you twist it and it helps distribute your grounds. It is not to distribute grounds. So what this is for is actually those little flaps on the side, they fit perfectly in here to give you the perfect bed depth of what this basket wants. Yes, you're absolutely gonna mess that puck up. That top layer is gonna be broken to shreds. And then you put it back in, tamp one more time, and then you're good. If you don't have a scale, this is going to help you get, do the same thing this does, but it's a manual mode of doing it. You grind, you tamp, then you check. If this is not barely touching the top, you probably need to add some more grounds. You still will need to be a hopper fed system that will give you much more consistent output and make sure that the hopper has some beans inside so it's a consistent push through and you need to purge out coffee in between your changes. They say it might take two to three shots to equalize. I do think you need to purge, you know, about 10 or 15 grams of coffee when you make a big grind adjustment. If you make just one, you know, one adjustment, maybe five grams is fine, but you'll definitely need to purge out some coffee. There are third party companies that sell bellows that fit perfectly into to this aperture so that you can single dose into it, bellow it out, and then you get essentially zero retention. Now this does have a rubber seal around the edge and there is only a small exit on the bottom where the grounds go. So it's gonna stay relatively fresh in here, although obviously oxygen can get in from the bottom. So as you can see, this is a touch screen and it has really nice UI. It's very intuitive. When we look at it, it starts with espresso and all of these you just click on and it will walk you through what you need. We have espresso, which that's you know obvious. Latte, so a bigger milk-based beverage with espresso. Flat white, a smaller milk-based beverage with espresso. A cappuccino, again, smaller milk-based with espresso. Chunk, chunk milk. Cafe creme, now this is big in Switzerland and is a drink that goes back 100 years or so. This is a drink that is essentially coarsely ground coffee in the espresso puck, pulling out like 
eight ounces of coffee, or like 200 mils, 250 mils of coffee. So you're essentially using the machine as a way to create filter coffee. You have a long black or Americano. They're made a little differently, but essentially the same thing. You have hot chocolate, a baby chino. You have tea, which is gonna be using the hot water spigot, obviously. And then you have milk only, if you just wanna steam some milk. So when we tap on the espresso, we have, over here is the grinding. So we have grinding ready, and you, as you see, it's kind of faded out, and that's because the portafilter is not over there. If we put something inside that portafilter holder, so it detects there's a portafilter there, you can hit grind and it'll start grinding. Down here on the bottom left where it says 13 and it has that little pyramid of uh, circles, that is telling us our grind size. So that means the smaller the number, the smaller the grind sizes, the more difficult it is for water to get through the puck. The bigger the number, the bigger the grind size, the, the more, easy, more easily it is for water to get through the puck. And then over here, you can toggle between saved doses of single and double uh, espresso. If you have a coffee in here, and you want to dial it into a single basket and to a double basket, you can save how what grind size it is needed for each respective basket. For the same coffee, they're obviously going to need different grind sizes because for seven grams of coffee, it's gonna need really finely ground coffee to maintain to hit nine bar. For a double that amount of coffee, it'll need a lot coarser grounds in order to hit nine bar. So, or in order to not stall really. Then we come here and this actually starts your extraction. So again, you can click down here and you have the amount you want. You can click here for single, you can click here for double, and you can click here to add an amount that you might want. So you can pre-save single or double, and that, you know, the idea is there is single shot or double shot, but in reality it just means option one or option two. And then you can continue to add different options. So there's another option. You can click custom to add yet another option. You can just keep it on two or whatever you want to keep it on. It really doesn't matter. They're just options. And you can save different volumes for each option. But if you want to have manual mode, which I usually do manual because I like to watch the espresso, I like to weigh the output, things like that. All you need to do for manual mode is you hold down the glass and then you're in manual mode. It even says manual brewing, tap again to stop. And here we go, heated up the water and it's starting to extract. There's that old puck in there so it looks gross, but that's the idea. Then you just touch the cup and it stops the extraction. On the Brista Express, as on previous units, you have unlimited pre-infusion capability. You can hold down the button for the extraction and as long as you're holding it down, pre-infusion will occur, which means that a percentage of the pump pressure is coming in, not the full pump pressure. It opens up Pandora's box for, for possibilities on your extraction. This machine, however, they decided to not include that feature of unlimited pre infusion. What that's doing is it is pushing water through at a much lower pressure than that, the typical brew pressure. And what this allows for is for the water to more softly saturate that puck and it can expand without being blasted by high pressure. Those areas of inconsistency in your puck prep are much easily exposed under really high pressure than under something softer. When that softer pre-infusion, you can expand the puck and potentially that expansion can help negate some of those issues. Whereas if we just went straight to nine bar, it might expose some of those. If this were my machine, it would be nice to have the variable pre-infusion, but that's a simple modification and I'm not against modding and I could modify it in order to have unlimited flow control regardless by putting a dimmer onto the pump. Here's the thing, a lot of people want to try to immediately upgrade their shower screen and their basket. Now I understand the basket more than I understand the shower screen, but even still on both of them, it's important to know that uh, myself and a lot of others have actually heavily scrutinized the baskets and the screens from the Breville products. I've put them under a microscope against other competitors and actually the precision with which these baskets and screens are made are very high. I show in my basket video that the Breville stock baskets are just as precise as IMS. Same with the shower screen. They're actually very good. The water flow, as long as you keep your machine clean, is a very, very nice water flow coming out as evenly as really most other machines do. So here it comes out. Nice and even droplets of water is not an issue. It's a pretty waterfall. Breville is kind of in a league of its own when it comes to accessories that come with machines. It comes with a water filter, comes with directions on how to make sure your water is great. It gives you a water testing strip so that you know where you're at in order to understand when you should change your filter out. It comes with different portafilter baskets, it comes with the portafilter, comes with the milk pitcher and a lot of other things. I have been for the past year or so working on a secret project with Breville. It's undisclosed and the way that my deal is set up is I don't have any, it doesn't matter how any of their machines perform on the market, it doesn't affect what I'm doing with them. It's a consulting type of thing for an unreleased secret project that can introduce bias just so that you are aware. 
Breville has in the past been known for knocking out of the park with their automatic milk steaming, like on their Bambino Plus and other previous machines. And this is no exception. You have a lot of different ways of getting to milk. Obviously, if you go to Latte, the milk is here and it's an option. You go to flat white, it'll be the same, but it's gonna have a different thickness. The first one was at four thickness, this, uh, five thickness, this one's at four. You come back, you go to cappuccino, it's at a six thickness, and you can change the temperature of each of them and then save them for what it is. So you can go to just milk only, and it's set default to 65 degrees, five is the level of foam, and then you have what milk it is. Temperature can go all the way up to 75. I do not recommend going that high, you're gonna be burning your milk. They have the set ideal temp of 65. You can go lower, whatever, it's, it's just up to you. We'll just set it to where they have it, 65. Froth level, it goes down from uh, one all the way up up to eight. Now the different amounts of froth is based off the drink or the type of drink you enjoy uh, guzzling down. Eight would obviously be if you wanted a really dry type of cappuccino. You go down if you want to do like latte or something, you're better off in the four or five range. We'll go to four uh, and then we go back. What they purport is they've done extensive testing on different settings based off the type of milk. For dairy, they recommend a very specific style of performance from this. So what they do is when you click dairy, it's going to perform in a specific way they found works best for dairy. And then they've also done testing with almond milk, oat milk, and soy milk. Now today I'm going to steam dairy and I'm going to steam oat milk and we're going to use their oat and see how well it does. In order to get the best use out of this, it is highly recommended to use the Breville pitcher that comes with the machine because obviously all of this is done based off of the thermal conductivity and the weight of this pitcher. We're gonna come over to flat white. Here we go, flat white. So we have uh, the coffee dialed into that 13. It just moved the setting over. I have the espresso at a double shot and then the milk is automatically gonna be steamed to 65 degrees on number four. I'm not gonna do my WDT and stuff. I'm just gonna do exactly what this machine will give you. What I do recommend before tamping is giving this a little shake. That's gonna help settle the ground so you don't have that over concentration in the middle. So give it a little shake and then we're gonna tamp. You kinda wanna go slowly on the tamp and then back up slowly. Anyway, so now we have our tamped puck. Should be good to go. We're gonna lock it in and we're gonna start our extraction. Now, because there's only a single heating element in here, you have to pull the shot first, then steam the milk. Now, a lot of people have this weird belief that espresso shots like die or something like that. That is completely false. Don't worry about that. It does not die. The crema may dissipate some, but that's not gonna affect anything. In fact, it may taste a little better because some of that carbon has released. The surfactants have fallen off due to gravity. It's gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. We're gonna go ahead and pull our shot. It's locked in. Click go, and here we go. We're gonna pull our shot first and then I have the milk ready to go right after. Now what I'm gonna do to retain as much crema as possible for the pour, because I don't wanna be embarrassed. I'm gonna stop it a little early for a ristretto style shot. I'm gonna purge the wand just a little bit. So I'm gonna get whatever, there we go. See that water? I'm getting the water out first. Now I stop it. Now I'm gonna put it on, put it on the sensor like so. Once we have it on the sensor, I can click go. Now it does take a little while to steam and you're gonna hear the pump going the whole time. That is completely normal, so don't freak out. When it's done, lift it, wipe off the steam wand, and then when you put it back down, it'll automatically purge. There it goes. Because of the temperature, radical difference, temperature switch, it will suck some milk up in it, so it, it uh, purges automatically so you don't have to. I am gonna pour from a different pitcher because I'm not a fan of the Breville pitcher as far as for latte art. Oh, ran out of milk. I dumped out too much milk at the beginning. And the milk was maybe a little thin. I probably should have gone to setting number five, but that's the first pour I've done in months. It's at a nice drinking temperature, a little hotter than for me, actually. I, probably, I prefer more like 57, 58, but... It's a very nice tasting cappuccino. So now I'm gonna show you how to manually steam or to override the automatic steaming function of the machine. It's very, very simple, but we'll go ahead, walk through all the steps yet again. So I'm gonna pull out my porta filter, wipe it dry. We're gonna place it in. Give it a little shake. Settle those grounds. Tamp. Tamp. All right. Bang. There we go. Just kind of a quick shot there, just to have a little bit less. And then I'm going to click go just to purge out some of that water that's accumulated in the wand, like that. When the wand is not clicked down, it's in manual mode. So I'm going to go ahead and get my position in place. And I'm going to start 
steaming. Now there's no real need to do this because honestly, I think the texture the machine gives you is fantastic. But if you just want to have that manual experience, you can very easily pull this wand out and you're good to go. And again, all you have to do is wipe and it'll automatically purge when you put it back down in its position. Make sure I have enough this time. I definitely do have too much milk this time. Texture test, all Gucci to Gucci. All right, now we're gonna move over to oat milk and we're gonna choose the oat milk setting and we'll see how that one pours. Now I've got to change my milk to oat. I'm gonna go ahead and I'll clear out the wand. We're gonna place this right onto the sensor. Good to go. This is a barista series oat milk, so we should be able to pour some lart with it. It's not looking like silky milky. It's looking a little bubbly for my liking. We'll, we'll steam one manually and see if we can get it any better next. It's not the worst in the world, but it definitely has more like visible bubbles and kind of a foam layer on top that is a little bit more disintegrated than I would like. Let's do one more. Yikes, the art's awful, but look at the texture. I think that's the biggest thing to pay attention to. Obviously my manual steaming did a much better job as far as the glossy texture on it. This oat milk looks divine. This one, you can actually kind of taste the bigger airy bubbles, not as good. I think it is a very fascinating machine that will be great for people who are just starting off in espresso or people with a higher budget that want a one and done machine and they don't have to fool around with all of the theory that is involved in making espresso at home. But for those of you that want to have all this automation, are nerds still in coffee and are gonna, you know, are gonna buy the funnel, do the WDT, and are worried about temperature stability, stick around, I'll do really quick, I'll do some testing on whether or not it's holding that nine bar pressure, and we'll test the temperature. This is PID controlled. So that means that there is actually a controller inside dictating the temperature coming out. Obviously these are never perfectly accurate as far as real temperature experienced in the puck, but what I have here is the Passato TPD. It has a thermocouple inside the portafilter basket, and so it's gonna give us a more exact reading of what the puck will experience. Getting a bit more granular, if you go to settings, there's a ton of options. Clean steam wand, group head cleaning, descale, water filter change, intelligent brew setup. Um, so you can turn on and off the intelligent brew setup. It's, it's up to you. Default milk, intelligent dose, brew temperature, coffee tutorial, which is really helpful. It's a 10 minute tutorial for those of you who are new. I'm not going through it here because I, I don't think that we need to. Customize drinks, and then there's some other options on here, notifications, guidance tips, date and time, sound and display, units, language, demo mode, help, about appliance, factory set, etc. In order to simplify everything, they're not actually putting numbers on here. They have default, and then you can do hotter one, hotter two, hotter three, hotter four, and then you can go down to uh, below default is Cooler one, cooler two, cooler three, cooler four. What we'll start with is default, which should be at 90 degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead, manual mode. You'll also be able to see over here the pressure that uh, it'll peak at, which is nine. It's doing nine bar shots. We have the low pressure pre-infusion, hops up to boom, nine bar, and we're climbing temperature right at eight, you know, 82, 83. It's gonna climb up and we'll see where it settles, which will give us an idea of where it kind of hits during the extraction. So it's still converting the water temperature that was lower in there. There we go, let's get that water flow more exact. There we go, all right. So it looks like we're at 93, 94, there we go, there we go, 93. So maybe default's 93. I'm actually not sure. They don't have that in the manual, what the different temperature ranges are. I was guessing 90, but we'll do 93. Then we're gonna go to hotter four and we're gonna see what the top temperature is. Then we'll go down to cooler four and see what the bottom temperature is. So now we're at 92. So the good news is, is as it's running, it's not increasing temperature, it's decreasing, which is actually, I, I prefer that. I mean, it's not really gonna make that big of a difference, um, but I do prefer it to, to cascade as it's going. And we stopped the shot and it was down to 91.8. All right, so I've set this to the hotter four mode. So this is four steps above default. So I'm assuming this should be around 96, 97 is my guess, but we'll see. So the portafilter, the water inside starting at 86. So it should go up to its peak pretty quickly. It doesn't have to convert that uh, too, too, too much. So let's see. Okay, there we go. So it's up to 91. It's up to 92, 93, 94, 95, 95, 6, 95, 7. 
955, 954, and it's starting to cascade. So its peak temperature is probably, it's close to 95, 5, 96 for that hotter four, which I think is more than hot enough for even the lightest of rows. So you don't really want to go over that. So it's now at 95, so it has a nice cascading effect. And there you go. Keep in mind, this is a one-off type test. Now I have it set on cooler four. We're gonna go ahead and check out what this temperature is gonna be roughly. The water is starting at 84 inside the puck itself, but we're gonna see what'll happen as we go. All right, so we're starting off, we're at 92. Okay, it's actually going down 90, 89, 88, 8, 87. Whoops, gotta get the valve in the right place. There we go, 85, 6, 85, 86. 87. So one of the issues is, is if the valve, the, this valve makes things a little bit difficult to replicate. Um, so the water flow going through the puck will help, will change the temperature a bit. So now it's kind of stabilizing at 87.5, 87.8. So it looks like around 87 to 88 is the lowest temperature you're getting. We're at 88 flat now. And as that puck erodes, it will slightly change the temperature. So as it erodes and that flow rate coming out is faster, the temperature does dip which is to be expected as it's, as it's going. So as it's really wide open, it's dropping quickly. So essentially the faster it's moving through that coil, the less time it has to heat, the cooler the water's gonna be coming out. So as the puck is eroding and that flow increases, the temperature will begin to dip. That's why I'm saying with a valve or with a set output, it's gonna give you a skewed uh, temperature experience because it, the temperature will be experienced a little differently through all the cut pucks, but it's not a big enough difference to really make a, a, a massive change in taste. So as Dr. Samo said in, in the sensory t experiments he was privy to, panelists were not able to detect a sensory difference unless the temperature gap was over three degrees centigrade. If you're having like a dark roast, put it to the lowest setting and it's gonna be around 87, 88. Those are gonna extract pretty similarly regardless of it being 87 or 88. I'm probably doing dark roast at cooler four. I'm doing like a medium typical roast at default and I'm doing a light roast at hotter four, something like that. And I think that's probably good enough. Of course you can experiment and if you think you're tasting a difference, that's absolutely great and go with that. And when you see the steam coming out, I would not be worried about that. That is, uh, same thing happens in lever machines and others. The steam coming out, yes, it's a sign of boiling water, but it can be boiling, flushing out, and that temperature of the water doesn't necessarily have to be over 100 degrees. As we noted here, it was not over 100 degrees at all. Because stainless steel is a poor thermal mass in the sense that it quickly heats up and, and dissipates, whenever you're heating up your group head, for the longest time, people said you need to have that portafilter scorching hot. It's actually been shown in some unreleased experiments that all, what really matters is that basket just needs to be warm. Both the portafilter and the basket are very poor at holding thermal properties. But if you hit the hot water option, water's gonna come out right back here. We're solid. Thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate you all so much. Check out Patreon below, hit the like and subscribe. All that stuff really helps the channel. Um, if you're new to the channel, uh, you know, hit the subscribe, follow along with some of the nerdy stuff that I do. You'll learn a lot about coffee here, and I hope that you brew something tasty, and cheers.